Okay, I've um, got a um, met American version this happened a few years ago, met some of her children, and she decided that the best way to get the household in order was to, as, as a management consultant, produce a PowerPoint presentation um, describing just precisely how the house should operate and how the children would behave. So she sat her children down and I, I went, through the, went through everything about how the house would probably be run in future in PowerPoint, and um, she was asked later, was this effective? And she said, um, oh yes, very, very effective. And so so your, your children paid attention to the PowerPoint presentation, did they? Um, no, they didn't, but um, after sitting through it, I could get them to do anything if I threatened them to sit through another one. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. I, Okay, I, when I was uh, preparing this uh, talk, I, I did my um, preparation for the PowerPoint, so in a sense the PowerPoint pre presentation is my notes. Um, and you can look at, look at the presentation on if you like, just listen to it, you would be effective, but it doesn't have any harm in you. As to this bottle of water and what it represents, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, it, it, just, it describes a certain kind of government excess, which I'll get to. I'll get to anyone a little later on. Anyway, this um, this thing here, it's a modem to allow my, inter my computer to connect to the internet using 3, 3G mobile phone networks. It's wonderful. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing because I, 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 I pay ten pounds a month to my my internet provider, my mobile phone company in, in Britain, and I get a gigabyte of information connecting to the internet, and it's wonderful. And I can I can I can essentially connect to the internet wherever I go. Um, and However, when I come to Poland or come to anywhere else outside the UK, what I find, I, it still works perfectly well, I can connect to the internet, but it becomes so expensive that um, I just simply cannot use it. Because whereas I'm charged a penny, uh, a megabyte, when I'm in the UK, I cross a border, any border pretty much, and it now costs me something like six pounds a, meg a, a megabyte. So um, it's 600 times more expensive for me to use this outside the UK as it's to use this inside the UK. Similarly, probably somebody who buys one of these things in Poland, it would be cheap to use in Poland, but if he comes anywhere else, uh, it just becomes prohibitively expensive, so expensive that essentially nobody can use it. It's expensive in Poland. It's expensive in Poland, okay. Um, or versus it in Poland. But, but, but yeah, I, mean, I, I suspect that the the situation we have in Britain, you'll have this in Poland relatively soon, where it's cheap to use domestic but the roaming, roaming rates are still outrageous. And the question is, why this? Why is it? Why is it so expensive? I mean, you cross a border and it becomes absurdly expensive. The fact that borders and political entities involved make me think that the fault the, 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 the must be government regulation in some way. So the state, the state must be responsible for this in, in some way. But the question is, why and how? Um, Okay. Um, okay. So um, the the European Competition Commission has seen um, mobile um, um, the, co the cost of, of roaming in, in mobile telecommunications network not just not just for not just for um, data but for, for voice as well. The the the, the, the European the Competition Commission has seen that. Um, Roaming rates of telecommunications are incredibly expensive, and we must do something about it. And, and the European Competition Commission's uh, response to this is to, to set price caps. Um, and in voice, they did this last year, which uh, and they actually put price caps on the cost of voice calls when you're roaming in Europe, which I think is um, 39 euro cents per, per minute is the, is the cap they put is the cap they put on their put on rates. And also that that was a reduction. These, these prices are still absolutely outrageous in terms of the cost. The cost of the cost of providing a call internationally is not, not much higher than the cost of a call domestically. And yet we're still being charged. We're still being charged 39 cents rather than the two cents or so that we may pay at home. That's what I pay for on my rate. Um, and the European, the European Competition Competition Commission has been applauded for this, and um, rates have come down. Um, and, and, and they made themselves popular, but still, still the the costs and the costs, the, the margins are just so high, and the costs and the costs and the prices are so so far separated from one another. There's something wrong. I mean, in, in data, T-Mobile, the American, the, sorry, German company, which owns mobile 
that seems to be the number of um, number of countries cut its um, cut its uh, cost of roaming for data down from six pounds per megabyte to two pounds per megabyte, uh, and was applauded by this. And so okay, it's only two hundred times more expensive than what I paid. Uh, and that's 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 hugely that, that's hugely great. So. The issue is the issue is the regulator is the regulator is being applauded for regulating, but in truth the regulator is missing the point. They're simply they're simply applying percentage cuts where where the thing is wrong from a sort of more fundamental point of view. Um, um, now the point about the point about mobile phones is that they are very very heavily regulated. They are, there are there are licenses. There are there, there is spectrum. There, is, there are there are small numbers of licensed operators in every country. There. They're, uh, they're regulated on a national basis. Um, consider, consider another technology you'd be familiar with instead, which is simply Wi-Fi or what you, the, the mobile internet you get on your um, you get on your, your laptop when you're in a hotspot. Uh, this is um, works 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 in a much much lower range, much shorter distances. But the um, the, the, the the way it works is entirely is entirely different. You um, you move from uh, one you move from one country to another, it's exactly the same in the previous country as in the previous country. If you will still find lots of free hotspots, you'll still find lots of um, pay hotspots, which cost are roughly the same as the ones at home. And uh, rather than rather than everything being everything being ruled by sort of large monolithic companies, it's sort of done at a local level, and your hotspot will probably be owned by the person who actually owns the premises you're using the thing. Um, so um, so, so the, clearly, 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 the model is different. In one, in one case, you've got national borders forming a very, very serious obstacle, and in the other, the other case, you've got national borders making very, very low, very low, very little impact whatsoever. And so, the question is, why is this? And ultimately, it's it's about it's about radio spectrum. In that mobile phone uh, technologies work in licensed spectrum, where the national government licenses the licenses the radio spectrum. Um, and and the operators the operators work, work on a national basis with licensed spectrum. The Wi-Fi helping is what's called unlicensed spectrum, which is that the governments have simply stated that this area of the radio spectrum um, is free to use by anybody. And there are there are some restrictions on it which which is sort of how much how how, how powerful the transmitters can be. And um, but the spectrum can be used um, completely um, by anybody at any time by anybody at, at, at any time when they want it. Now, um, the, 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 reason, the reason why licensed spectrum supposedly is allocated the way it is is that, um, the, the, that, that uh, operators will, will interfere with one another unless it's, unless it's allocated very precisely to one operator rather than another. Now, um, the, the people who have designed Wi-Fi have sort of got around that by coming up with lots of clever technology to prevent prevent uh, different operators from interfering with one another. I don't think that's what that works well. So the question really is, um, is this is this government regulation necessary at all? Now, yeah, okay. Um, okay, just said that. Um, okay, just said that. <laughs> okay, so um, the point the point is that um, we, 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 the question is um, the the a lot, a lot of our energy and a lot of our, a lot of our money a lot of a lot of capital expenditure a lot of our energy has been put into these these uh, 3G these 3G radio radio spectrums radio three D 3G radio networks and that they have been developed uh, in a particular way due to a particular kind of, reg of regulation the question is um, would it be better as I said the, the, the government the governments have more or less said how these networks will be developed and they have they have uh, they have they have licensed them in a particular way. And the question is, if, would things be better if the governments just got out of the way and didn't didn't uh, didn't license spectrum in the first place, or if they did in a very non prescriptive way? And um, what happened in Wi-Fi is that um, the spectrum the, the, the spectrum band which is used for Wi-Fi is, is an absolutely useless junk spectrum, which is why it was unlicensed in the first place. I mean. Um, Microwave ovens transmit on 2.4 gigahertz. They just sort of transmit lots and lots of rubbishy, rubbishy noise in that spectrum range. And because of that, it was not seen as terribly useful for licensed radio services, which is one reason why it was allowed for this, this unlicensed thing. But even so, um, the people who designed Wi-Fi managed to do all sorts of interesting things with it. Um, 
as I said, really, really spectacularly good things were done with um, with very, very, a very, very poor spectrum allocation, and, and things which, which cost very much and very little for users. Whereas the the um, the good spectrum was given to the sort of national monopolies that had run telephone companies essentially, um, and they come up with something which is much more expensive and in many ways, in many ways, less useful. And the question is why. Um, as I said, imagine what the people who develop Wi-Fi might have been able to do with that spectrum. Um, now, um, what we have though in the in the sort of license uh, situation is we've got this very very nasty situation um, where regulators and governments and telephone companies are sort of all all sort of captive to one another. Uh, it's a terrible. It's, it's a, and um, what what governments have done. Is traditionally they had um, telephone companies with sort of national monopolies, which were usually owned by the state. And when mobile and wireless came along, they um, decided that there would be more competition. And what they ultimately decided on was, was spectrum off, spectrum options to decide who got the licenses to run to run uh, to run um, run these networks. And um, it's still it's still it's still only a relatively um, Economists sort of liked this because they said, okay, if you're allocating scarce resources, then an auction is an efficient way of doing this. Um, and what happened, um, what happened in, in 2000 was, they held, was the European countries held these um, licenses for these new 3G networks, uh, these auctions for licenses for these new 3G networks, and the spectrum for these, these networks was sold to, um, were sold to uh, telecommunications companies. Now, 2000 was, of course, the height of the telco boom, and um, at least in Britain and Germany in particular, they got very, very high prices for these licenses, sort of um, 20 billion pounds in, in Britain and sort of 35 billion euros in, in Germany. Um, 800 million in Poland. Uh, 800 million dollars, too, yes. But as you said, very, very high prices. Um, and. Um, these, these, were, these were very prescriptive. They, they specified they specified that um, not only that they, they, they specified that you've got the spectrum, but they also specified once you had exactly how you should use it. In that they had to be used for this European mobile, mobile phone te um, technology UMTS. And at least in, at least in Britain, um, one thing which happened was that the existing operators bought well four of the five licenses. And and they did this. They did this at least partly to, to basically keep existing competition out of their, their existing new competition out of their existing service, services. And so what they did was that they they kept competition out and they sort of crippled themselves with lots of debt at the same time. And since then, an old thing has happened, which is that they've used the argument that um, we are paying all this money to the state for these licenses, and as a consequence. We have to make our money back somehow, and therefore we should be protected from further competition. And that is a very pernicious argument. Um, I, mean, I mean, firstly, a huge amount of money was was um, made for made for state for state uh, for states and governments to use in the regular ways they waste state money. But um, so 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 it was, it was it, so so in, in previous in previous previous licenses were often given to well-connected people, to be honest with you, rather than actually sold. And governments liked the auction, but because it, because it raised money. And governments, because, because the auctions raised so money, as much money, governments since have not been interested in, in um, promoting further competition. They've been interested in making as much money through, through spectrum, spectrum auctions as possible, and things like this. And the regulators which devised the auctions and the regulators which sold these licenses have become rather favoured bodies within, within state circles. Ofcom, the, the, tele, the British telecommunications regulator, because it has in the past raised so much money through auctions for the British state, has become a very cushy place to work and a very, a very powerful and fat bureaucracy as a consequence. And it's, it's very reluctant to promote competition. I mean, um, price fixing from the European Competition Commissioner is, is something which, as a libertarian, I would disapprove of. But at least the European Competition Commissioner actually does want to reduce, reduce, reduce prices for consumers. I think he's guided in the way it's doing it. But it, it does have an interest. Whereas the, the British Telecommunications regular, Regulator, Ofcom, is completely captive to the telecommunications companies, be, uh, uh, and, and will just sort of take take their take their take their sides in the arguments against competition. And it's supposed to be promoting competition. It's doing precisely the opposite. Right. That makes Okay, I've said that too. Um, and I've um, said 
that's it. The Ofcom is this very, very sort of cushy protective regulator of the UK. That is its headquarters on the Thames. It's a beautiful architecturally distinguished building. It's one of the loveliest new buildings in London, and it's built for a large number of bureaucrats to um, supposedly regulate telecommunications. If you go to a meeting at Ofcom, you will know they have this lovely, their own Ofcom brand of bottled water, which they'll, they'll give you in the meeting. Um, it's a wonder, as I said, it's, it's, it's because it's, it can get away with this because it made so much money in those auctions in 2000. It's just this incredible example of sort of state indulgence, basically. <laughs> um, and, and as I said, as I said free, supposed free market economists will, will say how good auctions are, but, but, this, but this is what they've led to in the UK. Okay, as I said, the, the question is, is any of this necessary in the first place? Um, the way the way mobile phones work is you, you have you have the spectrum you have a you have all the electromagnetic spectrum and you take very small slices of it uh, you allocate this for you allocate this for mobile phones and then you sell those to a relatively small number of mobile phone operators. Um, the firstly, firstly, there's, there's a lot more spectrum than, than has been auctioned. Um, uh, the number the number of mobile phone licenses has been kept fairly um, fairly small. Um, this is, this is partly because all kinds of other organisations have claimed that this is our spectrum and we don't want to give it up. It's, it's partly because, it's partly out of, I think, probably because they, the existing operators don't have more competition. It's partly technological too, which is that mobile phone equipment up to this point will only work in relatively small frequency ranges in the same radio. It can only work on a relatively, relatively small parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. On the other hand, the question is, to what, to what extent is this technological choice driven by the regulatory regime rather than the other way around? Um, but, the, the, as I said, there are, it, it, even, if, even if it was true that the telecommunications spectrum had to be regulated like this in the past, I don't think it's true going forward. There are, there are new technologies, um, there are new, there are new technologies um, like um, software, software antennas and things like that, which make the same radio can work over much, much larger ranges of the communication spectrum. There, uh, um, there is there's a new technology called ultra wideband, which basically allows radios to use huge amounts of radio spectrum at the same time. And if they do that, they do, these radios don't interfere with one another. So lots and lots of different companies can use the same. Uh, the same spectrum at the same time without necessarily requiring it to be licensed. The idea that you have to cut the spectrum up into little, little, little chunks of different operators, this is this this is um, this is largely this is this is becoming largely wrong. The the, 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 the situation is becoming much more you can simply allow your spectrum to be in a sense unlicensed and allow allow low barriers to entry and allow as many operators as you like. The, the sort of traditional cut of the spectrum and have high barriers to entry models breaking down. Um, um, it, it, may, it may seem, it may seem uh, simplistic to say there's a lot of spectrum that's plenty to be shared and people can get out of one another's way um, and, and do, this, do this by themselves without, without the state getting involved. Um, the state would certainly say that's simplistic anyway. Um, but, but technology is becoming cleverer and technology that can sort of avoid, te technology which different operators can simply get out of one another's way in, unlicensed, in, in an unlicensed way is becoming much more pervasive and probably would become pervasive already if the, if the regu regulation had not, had not required the opposite. Um, some people would say that if you, if you simply allow everybody to use all the spectrum they like, you'll, you'll end up with a tragedy of the commons uh, because it'll just become too crowded and everybody will, will degrade everybody else's service. This might happen eventually, but in truth, technology is changing so fast that um, spectrum efficiency is becoming much better at the same time, and if, if it would lead to a tragedy of the commons, it would be a long way away. So the issue as to whether the state needs to regulate spectrum at all, I think, is a, a relatively unresolved one. Well, actually, I, th I think it probably doesn't, but it's, 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 it's something which not, is not really being considered at all as a regular, at a regulatory level because the regulators have become too fat on what we have now. Okay, so do we have any concrete examples of um, any, any, any concrete examples of um, uh, radio networks, mobile phone networks, data networks working effectively without um, without uh, regulation or without government allocation of spectrum? Well, when when the Americans um, invaded Iraq, they it was said that uh, we need mobile phone networks right away. And the interesting thing which happened was that three or four people actually, three or four companies actually set them up before any licenses were allocated in this. 
I, I just mysteriously appeared one day because and, and people people on the streets were selling pre paid time on these networks, which nobody had no had licensed. Did they quite effectively managed to go out of one another's way? Of course the bureaucrats then moved in and told these people to shut down and we 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 were only allowed now officially licensed mobile phone networks here because um, because obviously obviously we can't have anarchy, we can't have people communicating. Uh, we can't have people we can't have people communicating on, on um, on um, mobile phones without us, telling, without, without us telling you how to do it because that would be anarchy. Um, there were more, more interesting examples somewhere else though. I mean, the question is, what kind of country has the best telecommunications system in Africa? Somalia. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I said, the, 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 so Somalia's government collapsed completely. Somalia had no government at all, basically. And what happened? Well, um, mobile phone companies and well, all kinds of companies set up in Somalia, but mobile phone companies um, set up. And you, you suddenly had you suddenly had ten you suddenly had about ten different mobile companies in Somalia, and you had extremely high quality. Um, you had you had, a, um, you had international long, long distance service for ten dollars a month. Um, as I said, the, as as Mohammed Hussain of Telegram Somalia stated, the government post and telegrams company used to have a monopoly. But after the regime was toppled, we were free to set up our own business. Um, only 1.5% of the population of the telephone um, prior to, prior to um, the Somali government collapsing, but 10 fiercely competitive telephone companies set up as a consequence. I mean, Somali have got private, private mail systems, which I suppose would have been listening to the earlier speeches. It's possible, to be, it's possible therefore, to be a little more pure in, in, um, in Somalia than in most other places. Um, Somalia had a national airline which had one aircraft. And it now has somewhere like 15 different airlines uh, operating on multiple fleets. Um, and um, as I said, and, and this is using using the sort of using a whole variety of technologies, but including the sort of GSM, you know, GS style uh, telecommunications companies which were designed for a sort of licensed regulatory model, these people still managed to get them to work and largely got out of each other's way, even without any sort of licensing or government interference. There's no, obviously, no taxation to pay for licenses, and as I said, we've got extremely slow costs in Somalia. Somalia is a very interesting example. Um, one thing I've noticed is, to be quite honest with you, um, advanced um, mobile telecommunication services are very often more advanced and more wi widely used in de developing countries than they are in developed countries. Somalia is an extreme example, but I've found this. I've found this throughout Africa. I've found this. I've found this throughout Asia. You find services which perhaps exist in this country, but or, in the, or exist in Europe, but I can't use them because they're too expensive, or I don't want to use them because the because the bureaucracy of getting an account is too great, or something like this. Um, I, I go to I go to Malaysia, or I go to I go to. Um, I go to um, Botswana or somewhere like that, and I find, I find they work there, and everybody's using them. And, and you have we have we have these terrible telecommunications companies, um, which aren't quite monopolies anymore, but they're generally state-owned or former state-owned companies, which are possibly competing competing on one another's turf. So in in Britain, you have you have um, France Telecom, Deutsche Telecom, and uh, Telefonica of Spain all competing in Britain, but you don't you don't have much competition, which was not these. These former, these former monopolies. I find, I find that you go, you go to the developing world, where in a lot of cases the fixed line services barely existed, and you find that the that the, um, the modern sort of mobile services have been developed and have been used in ways which the developed world hasn't hasn't discovered yet. And um, I find, I find this, I find it, I find this very encouraging. But I find it, I find it also as a, a reason why the um, developed world perhaps needs to watch out, because it really is, it really is a tremendous. The, the, the nature of our state regulation and the nature of our state control of our communications industries is really is really allowing places like Europe and, and North America too to lag in a way to lag countries which in most ways are much less developed. Of course, the optimistic the optimistic um, way of looking at this is that um, the optimistic way of looking at this is that um, these technologies are allowing poor countries to develop fast and to become rich. And the lack of regulation, or the, the relative lack of regulation of these things in these countries, and the, the relative lack of bureaucracy in these countries, is causing them to be able to get rich faster than it would if the bureaucracy is in the way. And, on, and that, that is obviously an unequivocally a wonderfully good thing. And on that note,